All right. It is good to see all of you today. I'm glad that you are here with us. Um, we're going to be continuing our study of the Gospel of Mark, which accurately be described as a biography of the life of Jesus. Before we get into our text, though, I just, um, I just want to mention one thing, um, kind of, I guess, personal on my own part, but uh, so, some of you already know that uh, my wife's um, sister-in-law, so our sister-in-law passed away uh, yesterday, so um, her brother Justin, um, his wife Tiffany, uh, been in the hospital for a few weeks and having a lot of breathing issues, uh, developed pneumonia, uh, put her into a, a medical coma and, and is on a ventilator, and uh, I got word yesterday that uh, things had taken a, a drastic turn for the worse, and called her husband in, and, and uh, he was out at a ball game with one of his boys, and um, said that she had 24 hours to live, and then the window took close to two hours, and then she passed yesterday afternoon. And so it's tough on our family, um, but the songs that we're singing, <laughs> while hard, they're good. Because we can come to Christ, we can trust in him, we know that he is greater than anything that we can go through, we know that he is sufficient, we know that he is, is our faith and our trust, our hope, our rock, our foundation, um, and so we lean into that. Um, this week, we'll be, at least Amber and I will be traveling down to Georgia, down to Atlanta. Um, not sure exactly the time frame, um, but just be praying for us, be praying for family members. Um, Tiffany leaves behind two boys that are still in high school, and uh, so it's, it's going to be tough. Um, but God knows, and he has the ability to comfort and to, to work in hearts that we can't do, no matter what we say or how we act. There are certain things that are not within our power, but are within his. And so we're going to trust him in that, and I, and I appreciate you guys as our church family, um, and just ask that you would pray for us and for uh, the coming days and, and uh, what might be, what will transpire. So as we open up our scriptures this morning, we come to a, a very interesting passage, again, that as we're dealing with this biography of, of Jesus' life, that we see that there are moments when Mark will step aside from descriptors of Jesus went to this place and healed this specific person or interacted with this person or cast out a demon or performed a specific miracle to where he'll give a big overview. And what we're dealing with today is one of those big overviews. It's actually the third time in Mark's gospel that we see Mark giving us um, just generalization of some of the things that Jesus has done. Um, but in order for Mark to give us a, an accurate biography, an accurate representation of Jesus, he doesn't have to give us all of the details of everything that Jesus did. He just has to give us the big picture of a big Jesus. Okay, And that's what Mark is doing in many different ways, is giving us the big picture of Jesus Okay, to make him known in many different ways, including this way of just kind of generalizing and giving us a, an overview of what had taken place. Um, Mark didn't have to give Jewish genealogy um, to his specific audience. He's dealing mainly with, with, with Greeks, with, with Romans. Um, that didn't matter to the Gentiles. He didn't have to talk a lot about the Old Testament, how Jesus related to the Old Testament how uh, Jesus would reference back to the Old Testament. You're not going to see a lot of that. We've talked about that in the past. Um, that, too, wasn't of great concern to a Gentile audience. But what he needed to show was that Jesus was first, okay, altogether different from man in the sense that he was the miracle worker. He is the one that astonished all that he came in contact with. He was the one with authority. He was the one with authority over all the natural realm of creation. He was the one with authority over the physical realm and even more importantly, the spiritual realm. It was embodied in Jesus Christ. Mark needed to show that Jesus truly was God, that he had the authority to do all things that he would be doing while on this earth. But that's not the only thing that Mark needed to show or that Mark desired and wanted to show. Mark needed to present Jesus also as fully man, that he was approachable, that he cared for humanity, that he cared for the individual, and that in his humanness, he could sympathize with mankind. In our weakness, in our mourning, in our longing, in our sadness, 
Jesus sympathized. And so Mark is going to bring those aspects of Jesus' nature out as well. Fully God and yet fully man. Over the last few weeks, we've had several very vivid illustrations of both of these truths, of the divine nature of Christ and his love, care, and compassion for mankind as he relates to mankind as a man. And so as we look at Mark's writings, we see that this na- these natures of Jesus are being revealed, and we see a picture of the fullness of, of, of Christ, of the Messiah. So Mark clearly has a purpose in mind with his writings, that as he gives us detail, as he gives us summary, as he shows us divine nature, as he shows us human nature, as he shows compassion, as he shows truth, all of these things paint the picture of who Jesus really is. And as, as Mark gives us these things, we see that he is not the only one, that as you read through the other gospel accounts, they too are presenting the same picture of Jesus in all of his fullness. And we see that, that God is revealing to us that which we most desperately need, which is Christ himself. Um, Mark doesn't try and give us, again, all of the details of what Jesus did during his earthly ministry. He wasn't a firsthand witness to all that Jesus did. He, couldn't, he wouldn't be able to do that uh, to the extent that uh, perhaps John would be able to do that. Um, Mark had to rely upon the interviews, conversations he had with those who were with Jesus during his earthly ministry. We've noted that before, especially from Peter. And then also we see that it is impossible to truly have an exhaustive biography of the life of Jesus because as John himself, one who was an eyewitness to the words and works of Jesus, part of that inner circle of Peter, James, and John, that the words that John wrote, he says that if all uh, of, of the works that Jesus did were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain that. In fact, let me just read exactly what he said in, in John's own biography of the life of Jesus. Verse 24, it says, This is the disciple who testifies of these things, wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. It's an important statement that as John writes about what it is that is going to be revealed in Jesus, that these are true statements, that this is something that can be trusted and reliable. It is dependable. These things we know are true. In verse 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. End of John's gospel. Wow. Some amazing stuff that's there. And so can Mark give us everything that Jesus ever did? Absolutely not. Because Jesus was there even before the foundation of the world. And so we have a biography, we have the snapshot, we have the picture of Jesus, we have what we need to know to be able to trust in this man that came to the earth that would pay the price for our sin, that would hang up on the cross, one day be buried, but then three days later rise again. We have what we need to trust in that, to know that, to have it secured in our heart, and for it to change our life for now as well as eternity, but not just for us, for anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord. So what an important uh, picture that we have that has been given to us uh, by Mark, that has been given to us essentially through the Holy Spirit of God that was in God's plan as we have the received word of God. Everything that we have revealed to us through Scripture is true. Just as John says, this testimony is true, everything that you have in your Bible, it is true. At times, what's revealed in the Bible um, is, is that someone wasn't being truthful, okay? Um, but Scripture is true in telling the account of someone's untruthfulness, right? If that makes sense. We read about sinfulness, but that doesn't make that the Bible sinful or it doesn't make God sinful. It makes it a true statement about the condition of mankind, that they will tell untruths, that they will lie, that they will sin against God. But everything that we read, it points us back to uh, the truth of Scripture, um, God has given us something that is dependable, that can be trusted in all of its ways. Sometimes I think about the fact if I want to create, if I ever desire to set out and create a new religion, or if you wanted to create a new religion, where would you start? If you wanted to get a lot of people to follow something and to follow you and to follow a new way of thinking and to follow something that is spiritual, we would want to present adherents of the new religion in the, in the best possible light, right? That they are, they're, they are perfect, that, that everything that they are doing is, is just ideal because of the principles and the things that they are following. And so their life is changed and transformed. 
We wouldn't do like Mark is doing to show the, the sinfulness of people, their mistakes, their shortcomings. Okay? We would show people that the answer is found in the new religion or this new movement. And exhibit A for why they should follow this new movement is because the people that follow it, they are perfect. And that they do not have the same problems that you would have. And so therefore you need to follow after that. Okay? Ugly imperfections of people. We don't want that. But the Bible shows all of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. It reveals all of humanity, and at the end of it, it reveals that because of the bad, because of our own sinfulness, we absolutely need this man called Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's the purpose for Mark's writing of the gospel. It's to reveal the sinfulness of man, to reveal the holiness of God, and to reveal Jesus, who is the only one who can bridge that gap. He's the only one that can change us from our sinful condition to holy, righteous, redeemed, even as we sang this morning, in the Father. It's through Jesus Christ and him alone. All right, a little bit longer introduction than normal for today's message, but it's the backdrop to the context that I feel we really need for the type of passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you haven't already done so, make sure your Bibles are open or your Bible apps to Mark chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at verse 53 through verse 56. This concludes uh, the chapter. And then next week, uh, you guys will be, will be looking at Mark chapter 7. So Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 53, God's word says to us, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through the whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered, in the villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might ch just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. All right. So as we approach these last four verses of Mark chapter 6, we are given, again, basically Mark's third summary type of passage that we've seen so far in Mark's gospel account of Jesus' life. The first summary was found in chapter 1, uh, verses 35 through 39, general statements of Jesus did a bunch of things. Uh, we were told that there he was preaching in the synagogues, casting out demons. Okay? So that was the summary about what he was doing. He was preaching and casting out demons. The second summary was in chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. In that passage, it told us that Jesus healed many people and that he encountered many unclean spirits, again, many demons, but it didn't give us the descriptors of everything that he was doing at that point in time. And now the third summary account is, again, the type of passage where we're not given the names of people or places or specific details in the interactions that Jesus had outside of the fact that it starts in the land of Gennesaret, okay? Uh, that's what you read in verse number 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. Um, it's important to note that while this is a summary of what Jesus is doing during that stage of his ministry, the events that are summarized follow immediately after Jesus walking on the water. And this is very important. If you, if you, in fact, they were, they were shocked, they were astonished, they were terrified, and the Bible even says that their heart was hardened. They were at the point, he's like, oh, I, don't know, I don't even know how to wrestle with this, I don't know how to grasp what we are witnessing from the point where Jesus had fed thousands of people, and then he comes walking on the water. But in that walking on the water, there was the revelation of his godhood, that divine nature. And they're just, just like, what do we do with this? This is, this, is just, this is beyond us. And so we see that these events transpire right after that walking on the water because Jesus then gets into the boat with them, and then they go, and then finally they will anchor in Gennesaret. And so it is another one of Mark's immediately thereafters, and then we have the summary statements that are going to take place. Um, so this is, again, it's chronological, but it is still a summary in, nation, uh, in nature. Why does Mark choose to do this? Why does, why does he give us these overviews of Jesus doing all these different things? Um, I've, I've thought about that, and it's difficult sometimes to, we don't want to put words into the mouth of an author to say, okay, here's the reasoning, here's why somebody did something, but why would we have um, a, a summary like this? I think the answer really is going to be found at least somewhat in what we talked about earlier, in that Mark wants to show his readers the fullness of who Jesus is. That's, we know that, that that is his purpose, is to reveal Jesus. He needs to remind people multiple times already that Jesus' ministry surpasses just the individual accounts that he would write about. 
In order to have a real understanding of Jesus, you have to know that he didn't just do 12 miracles. He didn't just teach seven different things. That he taught so many things. He healed literally thousands. That his, the scope of his ministry far out exceeds what Mark could ever record. And so I think that is one of the necessities of writing these summary statements so that people see the big picture of Jesus, so that they see the big Jesus, right? Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the summary details that Mark gives us here about what we're dealing with. So first off, where is Gennesaret? Okay. Gennesaret was an area about three miles long, mile wide on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's going to be between Capernaum. Uh, Mark wrote quite a bit about that. We've, we've talked about Capernaum in the past. Uh, and then it's also between Tiberias. So between Capernaum and Tiberias. This area is a region, um, but it was also the name of a town in that region. So you have the region of Gennesaret and then the town or the city of Gennesaret. Um, archaeologists have discovered that it would have been a pretty densely populated town, the town of Gennesaret, while the region of Gennesaret was also a very fertile plain that lied outside of the town itself. And so I guess this is kind of an agricultural area with a hub of population right on the edge. Uh, and so this is where Jesus and the disciples land after that late night, early morning trip across the northern portion of the Sea of Galilee that we addressed last week. But as soon as they get out of the boat, that's when the action really begins to happen, right? They get out of the boat, and the Bible tells us that people begin to recognize Jesus. Um, that's not surprising, okay, because where is Gennesaret? Again, between Capernaum and between Tiberias. A lot of stuff has happened in Capernaum. People had gone to Capernaum to see Jesus. So some of those people would have been residents of, Gennesaret, of the region of Gennesaret. And so... Um, People have heard Jesus. They probably have seen Jesus do miracles. Uh, they were firsthand witnesses to all these things that Jesus is doing. And so when he gets out of the boat, like, wait a minute, he's, he's back. He's here. He's now in our area. He's now in our town. He's now in our region specifically. Um, but the crowd here, it does seem to be a little bit different than Mark's previous detailed descriptions of the crowd uh, or of his two overview statements about Jesus. Because as the people are recognizing Jesus, Mark also tells us that they are running after him throughout the whole region. So literally wherever Jesus goes in this region, as he goes from a city to a village, and, the, and Mark also says countryside, so he's talking larger cities, very small towns, and like just kind of out in the country. He says everywhere he'd go, people are literally running to get to him. There's a fervor about trying to get to Jesus. Um, and they weren't just running for their own sakes because it says that everywhere that Jesus went, they ran after him, but they're bringing people with them. And so it says that there are people that are laying on these mats. There are people that are sick. And so that they're kind of just, I mean, they're following Jesus wherever he goes in large groups, uh, running with other people. Uh, they're carrying on beds, uh, what our New King James translates as beds, those unable to walk, those too weak to walk because of sickness. Um, the word for beds is the Greek word krabatos. Um, some of your translations are going to say mat cot, pallet. Um, in my mind, I think of like a medical gurney. Okay, that's, that's just kind of where my mind goes to. I think it'd be fairly accurate, a padded, something padded for the, the one who is, is um, bedridden. Okay, uh, and so the individuals are carrying uh, people on these homemade medical gurneys. At least that's the best way that I can think of it. Um, and so wherever Jesus goes, you've got tons of people probably in the thousands, literally running after him individually in groups of twos, groups of four, carrying people on these gurneys, on these mats uh, to try and reach Jesus. But what to me is perhaps the most interesting of all is that Mark tells us that now, whenever Jesus would enter a new village, new city, or an area out in the country, the people were begging him for something. Okay, Did you catch that? that they are begging him to just be allowed to touch the hem of his garment. That's kind of weird, right? Please, let me just touch the hem of your garment. What's the hem of the garment? Well, the hem of the garment refers to the tassels uh, that the Jews were commanded to sew onto the four corners of their outer garments as reminders of the commandments of God. Uh, it's actually very interesting that Mark would mention this, that they are begging to touch that hem of the garment, that part of Jesus's outer attire because it shows Jesus's own adherence to God's commands that were given to Moses as well as to continue Jewish custom of obedience to that command. Uh, let me read for us Numbers chapter 15 verses 37 through 41. Again this, this shows us 
Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament law. He's going to be obedient to the commands because the commands were given by God the Father. And so Jesus is going to do this even in the way he dresses. Even though he is God in the flesh, the Son of God, that he is fully God, fully man, he's still following the, the, the commands of the Lord. And so verse 37, the Bible says, Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them, and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Isn't that cool? That even just in the custom that the Jews had, that they were to have something physically present on them that they could look at. And, and God says, this is to be a reminder that you need to be obedient. This is to be a reminder of who your God really is. And so even in the clothing that they were to wear, they were to remind themselves of the power of God and, and who he really is, the Lord, the master, the one that they must yield themselves to. Now, did Jesus need to be reminded not to sin? Because that was part of it, wasn't it? It says, so that, so, look at, uh, at, at verse 39, so that your heart wouldn't be inclined uh, to the harlotry and to your eyes in, inclined to these things to sin. Jesus, he didn't need that part because Jesus is, he is without sin. The Bible is very clear, though, that Jesus was tempted to sin by Satan himself, but he did not sin. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. But the biggest difference between you and me and, and Jesus is that Jesus' own heart, his own eyes, were the only eyes and hearts that weren't inclined to sin. <laughs> he didn't have a nature. So he, while he was human, that heart and those eyes, they were not inclined to sin like verse 39 spoke of. All of the rest of it, though, is a reminder even for Jesus of the necessity of obedience to the commands of the Father. And I think that's really interesting because Jesus on multiple occasions spoke about how I must, I need to be obedient to fulfill all that the Father has commanded me. Jesus often spoke of yielding to the Father's will. And so Jesus, if he does, does this, if he is following those Old Testament commands, if he is wearing the reminders that I am going to live in obedience to the Father, how much more should we be concerned with our own obedience to God the Father? <laughs> I mean, really? This is Jesus. He is wearing and bearing those reminders of obedience to the Father. And yet we have hearts and minds that are inclined to harlotry. Okay? Now, maybe not literal adultery, but harlotry in the sense of taking in another God, taking in another, uh, uh, another central piece of our lives and exchanging that for something that is, is sinful where it should only be God. And so how much more should we yield ourselves to the obedience of the Father? especially since we have that sin nature. Our heart, our eyes, they are inclined to run after the things of the world, the things of sin, instead of the things of God. But God, on the other hand, he wants our faithfulness. He wants our obedience to fight against those temptations to sin. In fact, when you think about it from a practical sense, perhaps we should all be doing some more things in the sense of, uh, of visual reminders of how we should be keeping the Lord first in our lives. I thought about that. I was like, man, okay, maybe there's a practical application there, whether that's a verse of Scripture that we put on, on our mirror or something that we have in our home as a reminder, something that is written on the, on the doorpost. Remember uh, that they said to write these things on the doorpost, to have them, to bind them on your head, to bind them on your arms when you get up and when you lie down, to remember the things of the Lord. Maybe we need some visual reminders. If it was good for them in the Old Testament to be reminded of God, that same principle would apply to us. Not that we're going back under the law, but to be reminded of what God would expect from us in our obedience to the Father's will. Just, just kind of some, some interesting thoughts that rolled around in my mind as we look at that. Let's return, though, to the question of the people begging to touch that garment. Right. So the Bible says that they are begging to just touch the hem of, of the garment. Why would that be? Why aren't they begging for Jesus to heal them? Why aren't they begging for Jesus to touch them? Why aren't they begging for Jesus to, to, to do these? Why are they just begging to touch the hem of his garment? 
I would wager to say that it was the result of what took place in Mark chapter 5. Right? You remember that story of this woman who for 12 years had been hemorrhaging blood? What does she do? She'd lost all of her money. She had no hope in anything else, but she hears about Jesus. And she's like, he can heal me. And she reaches out to him, and she just barely is able to touch him, but doesn't touch his body. She touches the hem of his garment. She touches that reminder of God's call to obedience. She touches that tassel. And as she touches that, the Bible said that power went out from Jesus, that he recognized that something had taken place. In Mark 5, 28, we saw her desire being expressed. She said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And at that point, as she literally reached out to touch Jesus' garment, the Bible says that she was also healed of her affliction. Again, Jesus feeling the power go out of him, and he wants the woman to show herself, to admit what she had done in a positive sense. Jesus asked, who touched me? And she reveals herself. The woman owns up to the fact that it was her who had reached out to touch him. And Jesus responded to her in verse 34, daughter, your faith has made you well. It's going to be very important as we get to the end of our passage this morning. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Word had gotten around. Not only could Jesus heal, but if you could even just touch the hem of his garment, if you believed that he could heal you and you just reached out to touch the garment, you would be healed. And so everywhere Jesus went, Again, in this summary passage, it says he's in villages, cities, or the countryside. People followed. People are begging him to come near, to be allowed to just reach out and to touch his clothing. Why? So that they could be made well. Healed from sickness, healed from disease, disability. And the response was, as many as touched him, they were made well. Now that gives a pretty fitting conclusion for this summary that Mark gives us. It shows the care. It shows concern of Jesus. It shows his power. It shows the physical needs of the people were met in Jesus. But what about the spiritual needs? Well, let's take a look at the final phrase of Mark chapter 6. Because all these people are coming to Jesus. They have different needs. They have different desires. Um, some of them are going to have different motives. Okay? But as they come to Jesus, there are some common denominators that they have. The end of verse 6, those who touched him were made well. Some of our English translations read they were healed, they were made whole, or they were also cured. Okay? And so that makes sense, right? Because they, they were bringing sick and the, and the ill and the disabled and the diseased to Jesus. And so they were made whole, they were cured, they were healed. But here's the deal. The Greek word is sodzo. Interesting. <laughs> You're like, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. They were healed. They were made well. They're not sick anymore, right? And the vast majority of our English translations, as well as classical English translations, so if you're talking a translation that was done in the 1900s or in the 2000s, or if you're talking about older translations that were done in the 1600s, if you're going back to classical King James Version, or if you're going to things that were done in the 1800s, they're going to translate this word basically the same, of some sense of healing because of the physical connotations. But that's not the literal meaning of this word. Okay? In fact, once I read what the literal meaning of the word was, and then began to cross-reference the Greek word into other passages, I went down quite the rabbit hole. <laughs> and that can be dangerous. Let me just tell you, that can be dangerous. You can go down this rabbit hole, and you can end up way far away from what the actual meaning of the text says. But I went down this rabbit hole, and it just happened that Barbara was in the office there beside me. As I'm going down this rabbit hole, I'm like, Barbara, you i got to talk to you for a second, because she's the only person that was there. She's the only person I could get her attention. She's probably going, like, what are you talking about? Why? It, why? Okay? And so I drug her into this uh, just a little bit as I was working through this list last week, because the literal translation for this Greek word sozo, guess what it is? It's the word saved. It's the word saved. And as many as touched him were, literal translation, saved. And so I'm like, huh, that's interesting. There are literal translations of the Bible that you can get, and there's, I think there's five or six different ones that are kind of have prominence. I looked at them. Every single one of them translates it the same way. The literal standard version says, as many as were touching him were saved. Young's literal translation, 
The exact same thing. As many as were touching him were saved. Smith's literal translation says, as many as touched him were saved. The literal emphasis translation, as many as touched him were saved. But we ask the question, okay, well, okay, well, but what does that mean? Is this the same word that we would use for salvation today? That people are, are saved? It is. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Sozo. Romans 10, 13. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sozo. Is Paul talking about faith healing? Okay. That if we believe in and on Jesus, we will be healed from our sicknesses, our ailments, and our disabilities? He uses the same word. So is that what it's talking about? Will we be made well? Will we be healed? Will we be cured of our infirmities? Is that what Paul is telling us? That's not what Paul's telling us at all. The Philippian jailer falls down before the Apostle Paul and asks him in, asks him in Acts 16.30, What must I do to be saved? Same word, sozo. Was the jailer sick? Did the jailer have some firm infirmity that needed to be healed? No, the jailer saw a difference in the life of the Apostle Paul. He's like, you, you aren't like any other man. You would have run out of this prison and, and you're standing here. I heard you singing worship songs to God. What is this? I need this. What do I have to do to be sozo, to be saved? Not healed from sickness, but to be healed from my sin. What must I do to have what you have, Paul? There's only one sickness that we all have, and that's the sickness of sin. That's just, that's it. There is something that we all have in common. We are all sick with the illness, the sickness, the disease of sin. What the jailer was asking for is how could he be forgiven of that sin? You know what Paul said to him? What did he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. What did Jesus say was his primary message? Because this is a summary statement in the Gospel of Mark. And so I figured Jesus is going to do some sort of teaching. He never has done miracles outside of teaching, even though Mark doesn't tell us. I think he's already set the backdrop that everywhere he's going to go, he's going to speak. So what was that message of Jesus? He told people to do two things. He says, you must repent. You must turn away from your sin. And then you must believe in the Gospel. Paul and Jesus, they had the same message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, believe the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. They have the same message. And you know what? Peter had the same message, the message of salvation. If you read John, he has the same message, the message of salvation. If you read James, he has the same message. He says that it's only Jesus. Salvation is through Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So, let's go back to our text. Those that came to Jesus, were they healed physically? Yes. And that's why our Bibles translate that they were healed. They came to Jesus for healing of sickness. But did they believe that Jesus had the power to do so? Absolutely. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come to him in the first place. That's why they were reaching out to him. And remember... What did Jesus say about the woman who first reached out to touch the hem of the garment? Then word spread that, hey, you just have to touch his clothes. She says that by her faith, she was healed. Jesus said, it is your faith that made you well. What is faith? It's the same word. It's that belief. It is to place trust in and to believe in the one who is offering the gift. To place faith in Jesus. So yes, they were physically healed. And so it's not inaccurate for our Bibles to say that they were healed, that they were cured, that they were made well. But there's something even more than that. By reaching out to Jesus in faith, they were saved. They trusted in the power of Jesus. Their lives transformed. Healed from the sickness of physical ailment as well as the sickness of sin. They came to Jesus because they were sick hurting, and in need. But I believe that they got so much more than they were asking for because they believed in who Jesus was. They received the grace of God. They say, oh, well, they were just wanting to be healed. What is the grace of God? It's undeserving favor that God gifts and grants and gives as a free gift. Oh, they needed to be more focused on the spiritual. Did they? Or did they need to have faith in Jesus? 
What changed them? What healed them? God healed them. It was all in his power. He's the one that knows. And it was their act of faith in reaching out that changed. God that changed them, they exercised the faith. So let me ask a question. What about you? Have you honestly, truly come to Jesus by faith? Actually believing that what you have heard he can do, he will do. Have you actually come to Jesus with a faith that he really is the miracle worker, the son of God? Have you trusted him truly by faith? Have you done what that really requires? Have you repented of sin and believed in the gospel? That was the, that's, that's what all of this is pointing to, of saved, the message that all of the apostles and Jesus himself preached, to repent and believe the gospel. Again, the gospel, the good news that Jesus died on the cross for sin, that he took my place, the punishment that I deserved upon himself, so that I could be forgiven, so that I could be healed from sin. After Jesus died, he was buried to fulfill prophecies that were written over 700 years prior to his death. Isaiah 53, 9 says, They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. The empty tomb that they laid him in was a tomb that had never received a body, the tomb of the rich man. Prophecies fulfilled over and over again in Jesus concerning what we call the gospel, the good news of Christ. That which must be believed on in order to be saved, to believe on Jesus. But that wasn't the end. They laid him in the tomb, but he didn't stay dead. He comes back to life three days later, sealing the deal, as it were, right? Conquering both sin and death for any and all who would truly believe in him. After that, the Bible just says that he appears to the disciples, then he appears to over 500, bearing witness to what he had done. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians to remind them of this truth. He even told him, he says, most of the people that saw the resurrected Jesus, the one who died, the one that they buried, and then the one who rose again, he says, they're still alive. Why don't you go talk to them? Why don't you go ask them some questions? Why don't you see what they saw as they tell you about Jesus? They'll tell you. He came back to life. Why? So that we could be saved. Can I explain all of that? I wish I could. I can't explain it. Is there a scientific litmus test that I can do to prove the gospel? Nah, there isn't. But we have a text that is true in all of its ways. We have a text that had over 500 prophecies fulfilled in the first coming of the Messiah to the T. Not one was inaccurate. Not one did not find its fulfillment in Jesus concerning the first coming. And there's over 500 more concerning the second coming of the same man. So we have a text that has proven itself to be true over and over. We have a text that is referenced from historians of that time period over and over. We have the Bible referencing individuals who lived lives who were true, who were real people. And who also these extra biblical sources, they talk about those same people. We have something that we can depend upon. So when the Bible says that I must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I can be saved, when I read that Jesus says I must repent and turn away from my sins and believe in the gospel, I can trust that that is a true statement, that I actually must do that. Because this is not just a book. This is also the word of God. That this is God's revealed truth to mankind. This is what we must believe in. And that will lead us always to the person we must believe in, which is Jesus Christ. Men were willing to die for what they believed, for what they saw, what they witnessed, and many did so. Just read the, the accounts. It's Not all of them are written in Scripture. A lot of them are written just in historical accounts. What happened to the disciples? They were executed. They were killed for their belief in Jesus Christ and the message that they preached. But you must repent of sin and be born again. You must believe in the gospel. All around the world today, there are countless millions of others who bear witness to the fact that they have been changed. They have been healed 
from the sickness of sin by this man that lived 2,000 years ago, Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to talk to you for just a minute. I'm not going to drag this on. It's not manipulative. I'm not trying to play a trick. But from time to time, I just want to get real and talk with you and allow you a a chance just to, as nobody's looking, to say, man, I'm wrestling with some spiritual stuff. I'm trying to figure some things out. I'm trying to understand who Jesus is, what he calls me to, what he's requiring of me. We just want to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. And so I appreciate you guys' humility. I appreciate not looking around. And let me just ask the question. Do you know Jesus? Do you really know Jesus in the sense of is your faith fully, completely in him and him alone to be saved? I'm not talking about are you a member of this church or a different church or a denomination or you're being a good person or you're trying hard. I'm asking the question of have you been saved? Have you trusted in the gospel? So the first question I'm going to ask of you as we think through these things is this. If you were to die today, do you know that heaven would be your home because you are trusting in Jesus? The Bible says that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. He is preparing a place for those who are his. And if we die in Christ or if Christ returns, those who have placed faith in Jesus will be with him. Do you know that that is guaranteed and secured for you? If you do, just slip up your hand. Say, hey, I know that if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to be with Jesus. I know that because I've trusted, I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm what the Bible says, I'm born again. All right. All over this place. Amen. That's great to be able to risk your hand and say, I know that. that, I know that this is true. There's two more questions I'm going to ask. Guys, I'm going to follow up with you. Those of you who raise your hand say, I know that I'm going to heaven. Are you taking people with you? Are you pointing people to this same Jesus? Because I want to pray for you. To, if you've got a desire in your heart, say, hey, yeah, I know I'm going, but I am not being the witness that I should be. I need to be a better testimony. I need to reach out to others. I need to share my faith with others in a clear way. I know I'm not doing what God wants me to in that area. Pastor, would you just pray for me? And I'm not going to call out anybody's name. I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody. I just want to know. I want to know where your heart is. Because we are a family. We're in this together. And we need to share Jesus with people. Is there some in here that say, hey, I, I want to, but I'm not doing it right now. I, I need to. I need courage. I need boldness. I need to step out and share my faith in a more clear, a more accurate way. I need, just need to do it. How many of you would lift up your hand? Wow. Amen. Praise the Lord. That desire is there. You lift up your hand. It's like, okay, this is what I want. The Bible says that God gives you the desires of your heart. That if you really want to share Jesus, he's going to give you the open door of opportunity. But I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you when you go home this afternoon to pray and say, God, I'm struggling here. Give me clarity. Give me boldness. Give me strength to share the truth that I have embraced myself. To not let it terminate on me, but to share it with somebody else. And then each morning over the next seven days to wake up. And when you step, put your feet on the ground, say, God, today is a new day. Help me to share the gospel. Help me to tell someone about Jesus. Give me an open door. I guarantee you, you start praying that, you're going to see some things changing in your life. Ask him to give you the boldness once the door is open to walk through that door and to share Jesus with others. Guys, it's life-changing. This is what we are called to do. This is why the church exists, to share Jesus with the world. And one more question. Some of you here, you're still wrestling with faith, and that's, that's okay. Man, we've all been there. There's some of you still trying to figure out what does it mean to really be saved? How can I know this truth? How can I truly fully embrace this? What does it take? Back to the words of Jesus. To repent of sin means to turn away, do a 180 from sin, and trust in Jesus. How many of you would slip up your hand and say, I still need to trust Jesus. I need to be saved. I'm not saved. I know I'm not, but I need to be. How many would you slip up your hand? All right. Is there anybody else? You say, I, I don't know Jesus, but I, I need to. I want to. Is there anybody else? That'd slip up your hand, courage, and say, I need to trust Jesus. All right. 
Because there's a lot of stuff to pray for. There are a lot of needs that are in our hearts, that are heavy on us. But you know what? We serve a God that's big enough to handle all of it. To shape us, to mold us, to transform us, to help us, to give us what we need in that moment of need. And all he says is, trust me. By faith, trust me, 100%, all in, trust me, and I will lead you into all truth. And he will. Guys, I'm going to pray. And I encourage you that as I'm praying, why don't you pray right there? If you want to come down, we have a space up here. You can pray. Some people feel comfortable praying at an altar. And you say, man, I just need to lay this out before the Lord. You can do that. Just make sure that whatever God is speaking to your heart, that you don't just push that aside and say, I'll deal with that later. Deal with it now. Okay? Deal with it now. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are good, and you have revealed yourself to us through your word, through the working and the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us into all truth. And God, I'm thankful that we can come to you with our needs, our care, with our concern, with our faults, our failures, our own sinfulness. God, you're big enough to handle it all. I thank you for those Christians that are able to raise their hand and say, yeah, I know, I know, I know Jesus, and, and I know that if I die, I'm going to be in heaven. Lord, God, that's so encouraging. It's so, I mean, that's amazing. What a wonderful thing. We're thankful that you have changed lives and that you have transformed hearts granting the gift of salvation to your children. Lord, we also know that there are many, many that, that are in our family, that are our friends, that are our co-workers, that are our neighbors. We see them either every day or from time to time, and they don't know you. God, help us not to be selfish. Help us not to fear. Help us to be bold, to share truth in appropriate ways with love and compassion and care and concern for others because of what is true. Lord, help us to have the boldness that only can be given by you. Help us to be empowered by your spirit as we yield ourselves to you. We must willingly give of ourselves. Lord, I pray that Christians will make that commitment to call out to you and to praise that God open up the door. Now give me the boldness to walk through it. Lord, I pray for those that are still struggling with issues of faith, of what it means to be a Christian. Or the ones who lifted their hand today and those that probably should have. Lord, this is too important of a matter to let go by the wayside. God, I pray that your spirit would do what only it can do as we respond to you. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be faithful. And may it man be manifested in our lives so that others can see that faithfulness, not out of bragging and being better than somebody else, but because you are the best, because you are good, because it is your sacrifice and your blood that has covered our sin and made us free, righteous, holy, redeemed, set apart unto you. God, what an amazing gift. Help us as a church to have a unified spirit to share the good news of the gospel. Help us to continue to move forward in faith. Help us to show your love to the world, starting right here at home. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I appreciate your attentiveness. I appreciate your honesty, your humility before God. And there's a lot of stuff to work through, right? <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to talk through. There's a lot of stuff to be serious about. And so if there are some things that you still need to talk to somebody, okay? If you need to talk to me, I'm, I'm right here. Set up a time to talk with me this week. Talk with me today. Okay, I'll be right out here in the foyer. We can talk. Let's do that. If you're in a life group, talk with your life group leaders, your other life group members. Okay? Our deacons would love to have some of these talks with you. How do we continue to grow in Christ? How do we share our faith? How do we be more faithful to Jesus? 
Let's have these conversations. Let's have them at the dinner table. Let's talk with our own families about them. Let's compel one another on to good works. And let's honor God throughout that whole process. Guys, again, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate your prayers for our family. And um, I expect that we would be back next Sunday. I, I think the timing is, is of such that we will be here. Um, but I've already asked Braden. He'll be bringing uh, the word of God to you as you go into Mark chapter 7. As we go into Mark chapter 7 next week, um, it's good. God is good. He is faithful. And he can be trusted in all things. Thank you, guys. Have a good afternoon.